with some delays with the Zoom and so on, I'm happy to launch the semester with the packed house. I have a very important, very, very, very important announcement. Who got an email that said that uh, there are going to be snacks and so on? We didn't quite tell you the truth, but we didn't quite lie later. So, after the talk, after the talk, uh, we're walking over EB2, and either in 3001 or 3002, I do not know, I might know in 45 minutes after I check email. In either 3001 or 3002, we're going to have pizza, and we're going to have, you know, bottles of water and stuff like that. So this is something that we're trying out now, and we hope that um, this will energize people to hang out with Rebecca and ask questions and you know, have an interactive so, Is there going to validate people who actually started the seminar, you know, came to the seminar at the beginning, so they, they deserve the pizza? Yeah, no, no. So, 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 any, anybody who suffered while I was setting up, well, while I failed at setting up the zoo and Charles helped me out, anybody who suffered through that, they deserve like three pizzas. Right? Um, anyway. So Rebecca is an assistant professor in the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She received her PhD in mathematics in 2020 from the University of Memphis uh, with Pogues and Combinatorics. While there, she studied graph theory games and optimization problems on graphs. She's a class 2022 DARPA Forward Riser, advisor to the UK chapter of Graduate Society of Women Engineers, and is an associate editor of Screener Quantum Information Processing. Uh, her work is supported by the NSF, DOE, and NARPA. Aside from graph games, her current research interest lies in the intersection of quantum algorithms, combinatorial optimization problems, and graph theory. So let's let's launch the academic year with a round of applause, including for Rebecca, and then after that. Thank you all for being here today. Um, can everybody hear me okay? No? Okay. Let's see. All right. Okay. Move that up a little bit. Is that better? Okay, great. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. I'm excited to talk a little bit about my recent work. Um, so my focus is primarily on quantum algorithms. Um, but before we get into the bulk of the presentation, um, I want to discuss why people care about quantum computing. Um, just give a little bit of motivation here. So recently there's been a lot of hype in the media about how quantum computing has this potential to revolutionize how we solve um, different real world problems that are currently intractable. Um, so just even a brief Google search, we can find um, large companies such as JP Morgan Chase investing heavily in quantum technology. Um, to hopefully get some kind of gain out of it when quantum computers are realizable um, in the near future, maybe. And so these quantum computers have the potential to solve um, very complex applications, um, such as in this top image, um, molecular dynamics. So we know um, that classical computers can't really um, tell us how molecules move very efficiently. Um, they're not very good at that. However, um, an application that I'm particularly interested in is combinatorial optimization problems, um, which is kind of described by this bottom image. And so for a combinatorial optimization problem, um, we're trying to maximize or minimize some objective function, C of Z. And so this function is going to take a bit string for an input, um, and we want to find a bit string that gives us the best solution to our function that we're looking at. Um, so for example, let's take like a traveling salesperson problem in this bottom image. Um, so let's say we want to take a tour of the contiguous United, 40, or contiguous United States 48 state capitals. Um, so for an optimization problem, let's say we want to take this tour such that we spend the least amount of time driving. Okay. So we can start in some state capital, say Atlanta, and then say yes or no, we want to move on to Nashville for our next state capital. Um, so we can develop a bit string that describes this process of how we move between these different cities. Okay. All right. Um, so kind of the drawbacks to quantum computing right now, we have very small devices. Um, so right now, one of the largest quantum computing devices is by IBM. It has about 400 qubits. And so this is not enough um, or a large enough device to actually solve problems that we're interested in currently. 
Um, these quantum computers are also very prone to noise. Um, so if we have, say, a superconducting quantum computer, we have these qubits, um, then we have engineers who create these kind of shields to try to protect our qubits. Because these qubits are very sensitive to external noise and fluctuations, um, such as like any solar radiation or things like this. And so right now, these quantum devices still are not completely shielded from noise. And so what that means is that our outputs um, and our solutions that we're measuring to our problems may not be what we intend to measure because noise may have affected them in some way. And another drawback is that not all quantum algorithms may scale well on these devices. Um, so what I'm interested in studying is how we can make these quantum algorithms um, more efficient and give us better solutions. Um, by either reducing problem size or reducing the number of computations we need to perform these operations. And so I'm first, um, for this presentation, going to give a brief quantum background. Um, so I was warned that some people may not know much quantum. Hopefully, um, this background gives you everything you need to know for the talk. I'm then gonna talk about my two main research um, topics. Um, the first is the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, or QAOA. And the second is quantum walks on graphs. So for quantum computing, it's basically just linear algebra that we're doing um, with slightly different notation than maybe you're used to. Okay, um, so the first um, notation that I want to introduce is this top point, it's called a ket. Um, so this is the straight bar with the psi in the middle and the right angle bracket. And so this is just a complex valued vector with the norm of one, and it's going to have two to the n entries in it for some natural number. Okay, um, and so the norm one is important, so we're dealing with probabilities in quantum computing, so we wanna make sure that we can preserve a probability and have a probability space here. Um, this length two to the n is going to have to do with the quantum bits, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay. Um, the row below that, we have what's called the bra, um, so this is the left angle bracket with the psi and the straight line, um, and this is gonna be the complex conjugate transpose of our ket. And so together, these make bracket notation, bracket for bracket. Um, it's also called Dirac notation. Okay. Um, so I said we're doing a lot of linear algebra here. Um, so capital H, or any capital letter throughout this talk, is going to denote um, essentially a matrix that describes our system that we're talking about. Um, so I'm gonna use A, B, and C a lot in this presentation. This is just a matrix. Um, it's going to have um, dimension two to the n by two to the n. And then finally, here at the bottom, we have what's called the expected value of H. These are the angle brackets with the H in the middle. Um, so this is going to be shorthand um, for an inner product. So we have um, the bra psi with the H and the ket psi. And so this is just a real number in the end that we're looking at. And this is going to kind of tell us the average of the possible quantum states that we're in. Okay. So in quantum computing, we have quantum bits or qubits. And so what these are, um, these are these vectors that we're looking at, these kets. And so I'm just gonna give an example of what some small quantum bit systems look like. Um, so this first line, this would be a single qubit system. Um, so our quantum bits use quantum mechanical properties such as superposition. And so what this means is that um, if we have a quantum bit, it can be either in a state of zero or one, or it can be in some linear combination of zero and one. Okay, so this differs from a classical bit where we just have it in the state of zero or one. So the important thing about these qubits is that um, the coefficients in front of this zero and one state, these alphas and betas, they're norm squared half to sum to one because we're in this probability state. Okay, um, so you can think about this in general, this first um, example as a sum of vectors. Um, so this first vector is going to have an alpha in the first position and a zero in the second position for this alpha ket zero. And this beta ket one is going to have a zero in the first position and a beta in the second position. And so you sum them together to get a single vector with alpha and beta as the two entries. Okay. Um, and if we want more than one qubit in our system, um, we can generalize this. So we can have for two qubit case, we have this alpha zero zero plus beta zero one plus um, gamma one zero plus lambda one one. And again, the sum of all these norm squares is equal to one. And so in the end, we want to measure um, our quantum system to get an actual solution. And so when we measure our system, we no longer are in this probability space. We're going to get exactly one of these unit vectors out um, when we measure our system. 
So measurement is thought of as a projection operator onto one of these basis states. Okay. And that's hopefully all the quantum background you'll need for most of this talk. Um, we'll see. If you have any questions, slow me down or stop me. Um, hopefully, though, this covers everything notation-wise. Okay. So the first topic that I want to talk about is the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, um, or QAOA. So this was an algorithm that was introduced in 2014 um, by Fari, Goldstone, and Gutmann, and it's used to approximately solve combinatorial optimization problems. Um, so these are those problems like traveling salesperson that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a hybrid quantum classical algorithm. So while we do have a quantum circuit, we have a classical su optimization subroutine. Um, and this is equally as important as the quantum circuit part. Um, we have to be able to find good classical parameters in order to use this algorithm well. Okay, this is, um, as the name suggests, this is an approximation algorithm, which means um, that it is not always going to give us the optimal solution. Um, but the more times we run the algorithm, the closer our solution that we get should be to what's actually optimal. And this algorithm um, is proven to converge to the correct solution eventually. However, um, it's not clear how many times you have to iterate it to actually get the correct answer that you're looking for with the high probability. And in fact, um, some people think that it may require infinitely many iterations for some types of problems. Okay. All right. Um, so I always like starting with the circuit diagram picture of this algorithm before actually explaining what's going on in it. And so hopefully this is kind of clear. I know the image isn't that great. Um, but in this circuit, um, we have our quantum bits here in this left column. These are these kets with the pluses in them. And so this is like a classical circuit model picture. Um, so we have these lines coming out of each bit or qubit here. And we have these boxes. Um, so these boxes represent quantum gates. And so if a box overlaps with a line coming out of a quantum bit, then that means that that gate acts on that quantum bit at that time. And so the way QAOA works is that we have two main operators. So this first one is called um, the problem unitary here, this e to the minus i gamma one h sub c. And so here i is just the normal complex unit, um, e is our normal exponential, and gamma one is going to be some real value number between zero and two pi. This is often referred to as an angle. And so I'll talk about how we figure out what these angles are in a little bit. Okay. This h sub c, this is um, one of those quantum operators I was talking about. So this is a Hamiltonian. Um, and what this does is this is actually going to encode the optimization problem that we're trying to solve. Okay, so we have our classical optimization objective function c and we're going to somehow encode this into a matrix to be able to use in QAOA. Okay. So that's our first operator. Um, our second set of gates here, this x beta one, this is what's called the mixing unitary. And so what the mixing unitary does is it actually um, allows our probabilities to transfer between the different quantum states. So our problem unitary right here actually doesn't um, change any probabilities at all in our system. What this does is it adds a phase to particular states that we're interested in. The mixing unitary, these x betas, is that's actually going to allow our probabilities to shift around in our system. Okay, and this shift occurs based on what the phases are that we marked in the first unitary. Okay, so typically um, this mixing unitary has a very specific formula. It's usually a sum of poly x matrices. So a poly x matrix is just a very particular quantum gate that we use. And it is um, acting on our system for time beta one. So beta is again a real number between zero and two pi. It tells us how long that gate acts on our system. Okay. And so in the algorithm, we take each of these unitaries and we alternate acting them on our different system. Um, we do this p times, say, um, so this would be called level p QAOA if we do this for p iterations. And then in the end, we measure our outcome. Um, so we'll measure some bit string here, and this would hopefully be the answer to our problem that we're looking for. Okay. Um, so this is the quantum circuit part. So I mentioned there's a classical subroutine. And so where that occurs um, is here at this end. We want to maximize um, the expected value of our Hamiltonian h sub c. 
And so this expected value of H sub C is going to be some kind of function that depends on gamma and beta. So we're gonna take this function and we're going to try to find the gammas and betas that maximize this function. We then find these gammas and betas and we input them into our circuits um, and repeat the process. Okay. All right, um, so just to put a little bit more math onto the screen for this, um, we have our unitary operator U of C gamma, which is this E to the minus I C gamma. This encodes the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, we then alternate it with some mixing U of B beta and we act on some initial state ket s here. We apply these operators to get some final state ket gamma beta on the third line. Okay, um, and so the metric for success for this algorithm is the approximation ratio. This is this expected value of c over c max. And so when we're studying the algorithm, we often um, solve problems that we already know the solution to just to see how it works. Um, so this C max is going to be this classical optimal solution that we already know in advance. And this expected value of C is going to be this bra of gamma beta um, multiplied times our C matrix multiplied times this ket gamma beta. So this is just gonna be some number. Um, so this approximation ratio will have a value between zero and one. Okay, so the first um, bit of work that I'm excited to talk about um, is with my grad student, Anthony, um, and Professor Jim Ostrowski, who co-advises Anthony right now. And so when we look at this QAOA circuit, we have this Hamiltonian H sub C that I mentioned. And this is often based on the problem that we're trying to solve. And so we were discussing um, about if there were ways that we could somehow make this um, H sub C better to give us better results for QAOA. So does it always depend exactly on the problem structure? Okay, and so we're actually, um, there's been previous research that shows that if our um, objective function C has specific properties, um, so if we're looking at a graph, say if our graph is bipartite, um, then QAOA requires more iterations to find the right answer. And so we wanted to know, are there other properties um, that we can either destroy or add to our graph to make QAOA converge faster? Okay. Um, so in particular, does adding in operators to make a quote unquote bipartite circuit, I'll say what that is next, um, or break a bipartite circuit increase our approximation ratio? Okay. Um, so hopefully everybody knows a little bit of graph theory. Um, so we're going to say um, that we have this graph here on the upper left. Um, this is eight vertices, they're labeled zero through seven. And so the way we encode a graph theory problem in QAOA is we identify each vertex with a qubit in our circuit. And actually, if we're solving the max cut problem, each edge here is actually going to be a piece of our H sub C operator that we're looking at, okay? So even though H sub C looks like it's one big gate that acts on every qubit, um, this picture's a little bit misleading. This is actually going to be several two qubit gates acting on different combinations of these two bits. Okay. So in the max cut problem, we wanna partition the vertices of our graph into two sets such that all the edges that have an endpoint in each set is maximized. Okay. And so we were looking at random circuits for these max cut problems um, and seeing if we could get better approximation ratios. And so if we solve QAOA, um, or sorry, if we solve the max cut problem on this upper left graph using QAOA, um, we get an approximation ratio, I think around like 70%, which is not great, um, but it's fine for one iteration of the algorithm. What we then did was we actually looked at a subgraph of this graph, um, so we removed a few edges. Um, you can see we removed like the edge zero, four, and four, seven, um, but the rest of these edges are in the original graph. And if we actually run QAOA um, on this original problem, but using a circuit described by this upper right graph, we got a better approximation ratio, closer to about 80%. Um, so this is a significant improvement. Um, and so the reason we chose removing these edges is we know that triangles typically are not good for QAOA. Um, so like we have a zero, four, six triangle here in our original graph. This is a cycle of length three. So we removed some of these triangle edges um, to see what happens, okay? You can see though that we still have a triangle here in this graph and um, we still have zero, six, seven, and actually two, six, seven. And so if we remove 
those triangles, we actually got a worse approximation ratio. So removing some triangles helped us, but removing too many, um, we think destroyed too much of the problem information, so we weren't able to get a good um, approximation ratio. And so the reason that adding and removing edges impacts um, the expected value is um, because of this formula. So one of our big results um, is that we actually can calculate um, a formula for the expected value of each edge with QAOA for these random circuits. And so um, this expected value formula depends on the graph structure. And so if we look at the expected value of an edge UV in our graph, this depends on variables D, E, and F. And here D is going to be the degree of vertex U minus one. E is the degree of vertex V minus one. And then F is the number of triangles containing the edge UV. And so if we have no triangles in our graph, this last term here actually goes to zero. Um, so this doesn't add anything to our expected value, um, this last term if there are no triangles. Um, so it could be in some cases that having some triangles is beneficial um, because we might be able to choose a gamma and beta that make this last term positive. Um, however, if we can't find a gamma and beta that make this last term positive, um, then it would be more beneficial for us to get rid of these triangles. Okay. All right, so this is our first result was actually um, driving this formula. Okay. Then what we did, we took 270 eight vertex non-isomorphic connected graphs. And what we did was we took each graph, um, we made about 50 random circuits for each graph. So these are going to be circuits um, that do not necessarily reflect our problem structure. And we ran QAOA on those random circuits for these um, 270 graphs. And we got an average approximation ratio over all graphs of about 73%. So this is much lower than the average QAOA approximation ratio, which is about 78% here on the um, right-hand column. However, what was interesting is that if we looked at the maximum for each of these 270 graphs, our average maximum approximation ratio is closer to 83%, and our average minimum is closer to 68%. So these were our best and our worst case scenarios. We also found that in 81% of these runs, um, we were able to find a better approximation ratio than our average QAOA one. Um, so this tells us that while the QAOA graph structure does give us a pretty good approximation ratio, we might be able to change our um, cost Hamiltonian H sub C in order to get even better results. Um, but the way we change it maybe isn't as clear. Um, so those were completely random circuits. We did this same test. However, we used pseudo-random circuits instead of completely random. And so what we mean by pseudo-random is we took our initial QAOA circuit and we just randomly removed some of the two qubit gates and then we randomly added in some different two qubit gates instead. And we had similar results um, regarding the average of all of our approximation ratios and the minimum and the maximum. However, we were able to find circuits that were better than the original QAOA circuits in 94% of the cases. Um, so this is a great improvement. And so the reason that we're interested in this, yes? Clarification. So on, on the mm -hmm. random, you said you removed some and you added them. So was it always the same number of two cubic gates each time? Or, yeah, yes, okay. it was always the same always number. Removed and added some. Yes, okay. exactly. Um, and so, yes? If you remove edges from the graph, can you still get the right solution? Yeah. Um, right, so I should clarify a little bit. Um, so we take our graph here, and in QAOA, we would have a two qubit gate for each edge in our graph. So what we did um, when we looked at these graphs, we think about our circuits as graphs um, because there's this one-to-one -one correspondence. So we're not actually like removing edges from the graph, we're removing two qubit gates from the circuit according to these edges in the graph. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the reason that we care about getting these better approximation ratios um, is we're more likely to find our optimal solution. Um, and so this is the start um, of one of our works. Um, this is still in progress. Um, Anthony's making a lot of progress, so we're hoping to have this finished by the end of the year. Um, so that's the first uh, piece of research that I wanted to talk about. The second is with my postdoc, Igor, um, which is also in progress. 
So with QAOA, there's this generalization called multi-angle QAOA. And what this does is it adds extra classical parameters into the algorithm. And so the hope of that is that um, we reduce the quantum workload by putting in a little bit more classical effort. Okay. And so this algorithm also does converge to the optimal solution. Um, and while there's no proofs for how much faster it converges, empirically, it appears to converge much quicker than QAOA. Um, but the main issue with this generalization is we have a lot more classical parameters. Um, and so this expected value problem becomes a lot, our function becomes a lot more complex. And so this can be difficult for the classical computer to deal with. Okay, so our main issue is how do we actually find all of these optimal parameters if we introduce even more of them? Okay. And so before I talk about what we're doing with MAQAOA, I wanna talk about how people find parameters with QAOA. Um, so there are a few different strategies. Uh, one method that people use is called interpolation, or interp for short, um, and we'll discuss what these actually are on the next slide. Um, they also use what's called random restarts and transferability. And so we wanted to know if these methods can actually generalize to MAQAOA. And we find that yes and no, some of these methods generalize nicely and some it's not clear how we would use them. Okay. So the way the interpolation method works, um, if we go back to our circuit diagram, we have these parameters gamma one, beta one for the first iteration, then we'll have a gamma two, beta two for the second iteration, and so on until we get to gamma p, beta p. So the way interp works is that we take our parameters at the i minus one step, so say we take our parameters at our first QAOA step, then we take a linear interpolation of those parameters at i minus one, and we use them as a starting point to find our parameters at level i. Okay, so this is just kind of taking our previous step's parameters, starting there, searching for our next step's parameters. Okay, and this should work fine with MAQAOA. Um, there's nothing about the algorithm that should prevent this from working. Okay, we also have the random restart method. Um, and again, this uh, method seems to generalize fine, but it can be computationally costly. So the way random restarts work, um, you can imagine that our parameter landscape is some kind of grid with the gammas on one axis and the betas on another, and we wanna search through this grid. Okay. So for random restarts, what happens is we'll just randomly pick points in our grid, and then we'll start our parameter search from there. And so this is computationally costly. Um, we don't wanna run the circuit any more than we need to because it takes a while to maybe set up and fine tune everything. Um, so while this would work in theory, um, it may be too expensive to use in practice, especially since our optimization landscape um, can have a lot of minima and maxima. And so when we search for these optimal parameters, we often use gradient descent um, to find them over this area, and there's a chance that we'll get stuck in a local maximum or minimum instead of the global optimal. Okay. Um, the last method that people use, transferability, um, so the way transferability works is if we have a QAOA problem and we know what our optimal parameters are, we can make a similar problem that differs from our original um, very slightly. And it turns out that those angles for the initial problem will work pretty well for the new problem if they're close enough. Um, however, if the problems are too different, then we can't really move the angles over like that. And so there's not a clear way for how transferability would work for multi-angle QAOA because we just have so many more parameters that there's so many different mappings we can make um, that it doesn't make sense how we would actually map them. Okay. And so um, throughout this talk, we'll be talking mainly about the random restart method and the interpolation methods um, since those seem to actually perform well with MAQAOA and there's a clear way for how to use them. So first, um, we just looked at how multi-angle QAOA will converge um, using just the initialized um, random angles versus the number of optimization restarts. So here we're looking at the restart method. So here this x-axis tells us how many times we restart the algorithm, and the y-axis tells us our approximation ratio on average. And we looked at 10,000 graphs between seven and 10 vertices. And this is three iterations of MAQAOA. The first iteration is this bottom, the second is the middle, and the third is the top one. And so we can see that if we do just one initial restart for one iteration of MAQAOA, we get about a 90% approximation ratio for these graphs. But if we go up to our second restart, you can see that we get a little bit of gain here in the approximation ratio. 
But if we keep restarting, there gets to be a point around like four or five restarts where our gain and approximation ratio is virtually nothing. And so this is telling us that we're somehow finding pretty good parameters just using a couple different random initial guesses. Um, we also have this same phenomena for p equals two, although it tends to start flattening out a little bit later than p equals one. And then for p equals three, you actually can't tell anything from this data because we just converge so quickly. Um, and that's due to the fact that our problem sizes are pretty small here. Um, so if we had larger problem sizes, all of these lines would be shifted down significantly, potentially. And so we'd actually be able to get more data. Um, however, it is very difficult to run uh, three iterations of multi-angle QAOA, which is why we're limited to such small problems right now. Okay. We then looked at how MAQAOA converges with respect to QAOA. Um, so this top set is multi-angle QAOA and the bottom set is the original algorithm. And again, looking between seven and 10 vertex graphs, um, and we have 10,000 of these graphs. So for QAOA, um, this is, x-axis is uh, the number of iterations P, Sorry, in the y-axis is the average approximation ratio. For QAOA, we use the interpolation strategy to find our initial angles. And for multi-angle QAOA, we just use two initial random restarts. And you can see that we actually have um, a very good approximation ratio starting out with MAQAOA, and it converges very quickly. Um, whereas for the original QAOA, um, it takes at least 10 iterations to start to get very close to one. Okay, so this is a significant improvement. Um, we have between three and four iterations of MAQAOA. We can use that to find our correct solution, whereas the original algorithm, um, we need significantly more iterations. Um, so this improvement is great um, because the more of these quantum gates we use, the more noise is introduced into our system. So we wanna try to minimize the number of gates we're using. Um, and so multi-angle QAOA would require far fewer gates at three iterations then QAOA would require out to 10 iterations. Okay. All right, um, we did the same experiment here, um, but instead of looking at um, the vertex size for each of these lines, we're actually looking at the average edge diameter for these vertices. And so when we're looking at the expected value of QAOA with these edge diameters, um, the way the algorithm works is if we wanna find the expected value of a single edge in our graph, then if we do one iteration of QAOA, the expected value for a single edge will depend on the edges that neighbor it, and only those edges. If we go out to a second iteration of QAOA, the expected value for the single edge now depends on the neighbors and on its neighbors' neighbors. And so the more iterations of the algorithm we use, um, the more edges impact the expected value for any single edge. And so we wanted to look at what we're calling the edge diameter. Yes? Um, could you relate this to how you just mentioned that this actually translates to how you were doing the circuit elements? Are you thinking that it's related? Yeah. Yeah, um, so the question is how this relates um, to these edges that we're removing and replacing. Um, so when we do that one iteration of QAOA, the expected value of any edge here just depends on its neighbors. And so for this experiment, we only did one iteration of QAOA, and so we were very specifically looking at removing triangles. Um, so these would just be neighbors um, that together make this three cycle. And so we looked specifically at these triangles because triangles are not um, great for QAOA in general. Okay, yeah, um, so we will say that removing some triangles helps. Um, so here we removed one or two triangles in this upper case. Um, but removing too many, we think just destroyed too much of the initial problem structure where it was no longer useful for that problem. Um, and so you can think about removing these edges as removing those particular two cubic gates from that circuit. Um, and so we eventually want to find a way to remove maybe the fewest number of edges to increase the approximation ratio. That way we still preserve most of the problem that we're looking at. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Uh, is removing some of, uh, does removing some of the edges um, make the circuit depth a bit less? So 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, so removing some of these edges um, can decrease the circuit depth. Um, so it depends on which edges we remove um, because we have nice ways of how we can actually schedule these gates on the quantum computer. Um, so you can remove some to decrease the depth. Sometimes though, the ones that you remove won't decrease the depth because of how they're scheduled. Um, all right, so we just looked at these plots um, in relation to edge diameter, and we see that they're pretty similar to the previous plot, um, which would be expected. Okay. So for these two last plots, um, we're going to define that an approximation ratio of greater than 0.9995 is what we're looking at for convergence here. And so we were interested in determining um, if we can do a number of iterations of QAOA roughly equal to the edge diameter if a graph would converge at that point in time. Okay, and so we looked at, again, these 10,000 graphs um, and we took that their average edge diameter was roughly four here. Um, and we looked at seven, eight, nine, and 10 vertex graphs. And we just plotted um, the number of graphs that have converged on the left column versus the P it takes for that graph to converge minus that graph's particular edge diameter. Okay, and so this plot is with two initial re random restarts for multi-angle QAOA. Um, and this is a cumulative plot here. Okay, so you can see that by the time we get to zero, almost all of our graphs have converged and we have a few outliers, it's less than a thousand. Um, and by the time we get to one, practically all have converged to the optimal solution. If we look at this same plot, but with 10 initial random restarts, we actually see that everything converges. Um, if we run it, uh, QAOA um, P times where P is equal to the edge diameter. Okay, so this work seems to suggest that if we know the edge diameter of our graph, um, we can just perform QAOA for that many iterations. Um, but again, these are very small graphs. Um, we can't really go past this simulation wise. Um, so it would be of interest to either figure out how to simulate more graphs to see if this trend still holds or to maybe develop some mathematical proof um, of this concept. However, um, my background's in math and I think a mathematical proof of this um, is very intimidating even to me. Um, I don't know what that proof would look like um, or where to even start that. Um, so I think larger simulations would be a good starting point. Okay, so that was the first half um, of everything that I wanted to talk about. Um, and we still have some time, so I'm gonna talk briefly on quantum walks. Um, does, do people know what a classical random walk is on a graph? Hopefully, okay. So just a brief overview if you don't know. Um, so I'm looking at continuous time walks. And so in a classical continuous time random walk, we have some graph and we have what's called a walker and the walker is going to be on one of the vertices in our graph. Our walker is allowed to move to other vertices in the graph based on the graph structure. Um, and so the quantum, continuous time quantum walk is analogous to this, except now instead of our walker being on a particular vertex, our walker has a probability of being on any number of vertices in our graph. And our walker is going to move along this graph um, according to the Schrodinger equation. Um, and so the Schrodinger equation, um, our Hamiltonian here, um, I'm drawing a blank, sorry. Our Hamiltonian depends on our graph structure. Okay, so there are two formulations people often use. Um, they either let the Hamiltonian be the adjacency matrix or the graph Laplacian. Um, so I'll be using the adjacency matrix formulation for this. Okay. And the reason people care about quantum walks, um, it was shown in like about 2004 or so, that quantum walks are very, very good at spatial searches, um, that they have a significant um, increase in performance over classical random walks. Um, and I would refer you to reference two, um, which will be posted at the end for a really good introduction on this. Okay. And so in these continuous time quantum walks or CTQWs, um, in the initial paper, um, these graphs were just stationary. So we just have a graph, the walker just moves along it for some time, and then we measure to see where the walker is in the end. In 2019, um, some people introduced what's called a dynamic continuous time quantum walk. And so in these dynamic quantum walks, our graphs actually change structure at different times in our process. Okay. 
Um, so it does assume that the number of vertices in our graph remains constant and that we can just add and remove edges at different points in time. And so these walks are universal for computation. And so what that means is if our walker starts in some particular probability um, of being in a different combination of vertices in the beginning, we can find some graphs and some times, let the walker propagate on that graph for however long, and in the end, the walker will end up in some arbitrary state that we want. So we can always find this sequence of graphs to move our walker to where we want it to be. Okay. And so um, these dynamic graphs, we think about them as ordered pairs of graphs with propagation times. And so in this example here, on the left picture, we have a graph G1. Um, it just has a self loop here on vertex one for time three pi over two. Once that time is up, we remove the self loop and add a edge between the two vertices for time pi over four, and then we can change the graph again at the third step. Okay, um, so in this, each of these vertices is a computational basis state um, of the system that we're looking at. So this would be a single qubit, um, will be represented by this zero in this one vertex, and in the end, we'll get some probability of being in the zero state and some probability of being in the one state. So this is one of um, the gates that makes up a universal um, computation set in quantum computing. Um, so this universal set would be the Hadamard or H gate, um, also a control not gate and a T gate. Um, and we'll show what those look like in a minute. I have a yep. basic question. Okay. What's the difference between having no edges and, and one self edge? Yeah. It's going to stay in the same state. Right. So the no edge, um, it stays completely the same. The self edge, it'll just add a phase factor. Okay. All right, um, so to formalize this a bit more, we have a walker in some initial state psi naught. We have our sequence of graphs. Um, we're gonna take the adjacency matrices of these graphs A sub i and the spectral norm. Um, so that's gonna be the, si or the norm of the largest eigenvalue of that matrix. We start in our initial state and we act on it by this e to the minus i A1 T1 over the norm of A1. Um, so that's how our walker is going to walk on this first graph. Um, then that switches and we go to this e to the minus i a t2, or a2 t2 over a2, that's how the walker acts on this second graph and so on until we get to the end of our sequence. Okay. And so these are the t and the control not gates in that universal gate set. Okay. All right. So this work um, is currently with Zane Salim, who's a staff scientist at Argonne National Lab, uh, G. Liu, who's his postdoc, and then Teek Tamesh and Fred Chong, who are scientists at Inflection, and my newest grad student, Shamim Wrighton, um, at the University of Tennessee. And so this work was a little bit motivated. Um, because we can change these different edges at different times in the graph, um, we wanted to know, are there ways that we can change these edges in these times to kind of get the smallest sequence of quantum walks um, in order to perform some computation that we want to perform. So how can we minimize the number of graphs that we're using? And how can we write an arbitrary unitary using these graphs? We're also interested in determining an algorithmic way to combine and simplify these graphs. Um, so there was a paper in 2021 that gave some different criteria for how if we have particular graphs in a sequence, we can combine them to shorten our propagation time. Um, this is kind of an ad hoc method. Um, so we're looking and actually finding an algorithmic way to perform these simplifications. And then we're also interested in how do we actually implement these quantum locks. Um, so these particular types of quantum locks have not been implemented before. And so we have these kind of three topics. Um, UT is kind of handling this first topic. Uh, Argon's leading the second topic and Inflection's leading the last topic for the hardware. And I know there's not a lot of time left and I got way too wordy with these last slides I realized last night. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of briefly summarize these without actually going through every point here. Um, so let's say we have some walker in the state psi equal to alpha zero plus beta one. So we have some initial single qubit state. And we wanna transform this into some other qubit state, gamma zero plus lambda one. Uh, again, the sum of the norms for each of these two sets of coefficients will be equal to one. So we can implement this with a dynamic walk using um, this middle graph here in the H gate. So what this middle graph is doing is it's kind of allowing the walker to go back and forth between these zero and one states. Um, so it would make sense that if we want to move um, 
this alpha to say this gamma and beta to some lambda that we would need to somehow connect these zero and one states to let the probability shift around a bit. Okay, and so we can actually do that. Um, if we look at um, this e to the minus iat term that we get from taking that matrix exponential, this is just going to be a matrix. It's going to be a two by two matrix. It'll have cosines on the main diagonal and minus i sine of t's on the off diagonal. And so we can actually um, just take this vector matrix, multiply it by our vector, um, and we get these kind of equations. If we just set this top equal to lambda and the bottom equal to gamma and solve for t, um, we can then get to an arbitrary state we want up to some phase factor. Um, and so getting rid of the phase factor is a little bit difficult because we actually have these i's um, in some parts but not in others. Um, so this is easy to do for a single qubit case. Um, we're looking at how do we generalize this to multiple qubits next. Okay, and so that's all that I really want to touch on that. That's a very new project. It just started like a month ago, um, but we're really excited about it. Okay, and so I just want to leave with some big picture ideas and questions, um, things that I'm interested in in quantum algorithms and how graph theory can impact that. Um, so in these classical optimization problems, we have a lot of helpful graph theory tools, um, especially in algorithm design. And so until recently, it was primarily physicists who have been working in quantum computing, um, but more and more recently, other areas of science are becoming involved in quantum research, such as like mathematicians and engineers. And so I'm interested in bringing in some of these classical graph theory optimization techniques into quantum algorithms to see if we can actually improve their performance. I'm also interested just in solving these large scale optimization problems using um, combinations of classical and quantum methods. Um, and this last problem, our project, the quantum walk one actually motivates the last few questions. Um, and so the reason this project actually started was the Department of Energy had a call out a couple months ago um, asking for people to submit proposals on how to pick the best computational model for a particular problem. And so in quantum computing, we have several different ways of performing computation. Um, so quantum walks is one method of performing a computation. Um, we also have just like the gate model, like in classical computing, um, and different other models, um, like adiabatic computing. And so there are algorithms that have been designed for each of these particular models of computation, um, but it's not clear if we can take an algorithm, say designed for a quantum walk model, and turn it into an efficient algorithm for the gate model. Um, so this quantum research is kind of coming out of how can we or efficiently convert models from one, um, or sorry, how we can efficiently convert algorithms from one model of computing to another. Okay. And uh, these are the references. Um, reference two was a good quantum walk um, reference, highly recommend that. And uh, so the first half of this work, um, QAO is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Um, and then the second half is soon to be a DOE award. Um, Argonne and Inflection already have their part of the award. UT is waiting on their part right now. Um, so with that, I will end it. And are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Algorithm better on optimization than the VQE. Okay, so yeah, the question is, is QAOA better than VQE? Um, so QAO is actually just a very specific case of VQE. Um, uh, so, are there yeah. any tests for like, uh, you know, to maybe compare both uh, methods to see which one, you know, performs better? <coughs> so I'm not sure if there are any. Um, so that would be something to look into, I don't know. Um, but since QAO is a specific case of VQE, I don't know if there would be much of a difference between the two. Yes? Uh, going back to the MaxCut example, um, mm -hmm. so MaxCut often has multiple like optimal solutions. Have you looked yep. into whether this, is, this method is like uh, preferring one solution over another solution or, or something like that? Yeah, um, so I will say that QAOA, um, any solutions that have bit flip symmetry, QAOA does weight them equally. Um, but in general, um, we have not looked at, you know, for solutions that are maybe both optimal but are not related by bit flip symmetry, how QAOA prefers them. Um, so that would be something to look at. Yeah. Yes.
Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing. Can you repeat that? So, uh, so in the last uh, big picture slide, you show that uh, it's interesting to understand quantum algorithms uh, from the perspective of graph theory and the space time blocks. And I was just wondering, you know, just uh, you were thinking about uh, only uh, two precise data set, right? So if we know that it's sufficient to synthesize any given unitary using the timer and key gate and the signal gate from the slowly entire period. So I'm wondering, like, if you can elaborate more on what interesting properties about uh, surface synthesis uh, in the discretized and gate model uh, from the perspective of the graph theory. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for this last project, we're trying to get away from that H, T, and C not gate. Um, so these quantum walks, um, if we think about them as graphs with different edges in them. Um, we can have a lot of different combinations of these graphs. Um, and so these universal gate sets, um, you can see they all kind of follow a similar pattern. Like we have some kind of self loops, which give us a phase. Um, we have some kind of way to connect our different basis states. And then we have another self loop. And so we want to get away um, from this kind of rigid pattern that they, um, authors of this um, method actually introduced. And we want to see what happens if we add in different extra edges or if we have self loops with edges at the same time, if that um, is going to impact our computation. So while there is an efficient way um, for like this control not T and H gate, um, and we do have simplification methods, um, our goal is really to look at how other graph structures um, can give us different quantum states. Um, so is there a particular graph structure that always gives us a state with a particular nice quantity, or um, quality, I should say. Maybe yeah. second question. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, from a quantum perspective, it's known that you can achieve quantum speed up as compared to classical walks. Um, right. Or classical walks mm -hmm. And I guess you also talked about continuous time quantum walk, not just with time step quantum walk. And um, can you say, maybe comment a little bit on if there might be possible speed ups Yeah. Yeah. So um, this dynamic quantum walk method was actually inspired um, by a use of continuous time quantum walks. Um, so I think it was also in that um, reference to here. Um, the authors look at solving what's called the binary welded tree problem. So in that problem, we have two balanced binary trees. And we connect the leaves of the binary trees by some cycle um, that alternates back and forth between the two trees. And the goal of that problem is if we start um, at one of the roots of one of the trees, we want to traverse the graph and we want to stop when we have reached the root of the other tree with high probability. And so this dynamic quantum walk was actually inspired by that because in that algorithm, what the authors do um, is they keep their edges for the graph turned on for the most part, but then they'll just briefly remove edges for like an epsilon time period in the middle there. And they're able to get um, that that algorithm does have um, a significant speed up over the classical binary welded tree algorithm. Okay. Um, so these quantum walks um, do have speed ups over classical counterparts in the continuous time case also. Um, and so we are, once we figure out this algorithmic way to convert um, these quantum walks and to combine and simplify them, um, once we do that, then we're going to look more at um, if we can actually use these new graphs and these simplifications um, to get speed ups for other types of problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so.
that case, let's uh, thank uh, Rebecca again. And uh, as a reminder, DB2, 3,000.